What's up, everybody, and welcome to Real Time for the Real Everyday Movie Fan. I'm Ryan Murphy. And I'm James Sheridan. And today we are giving you our real-time review of Star Trek Picard Season 3, Episode 7. We're getting towards the end now. <laughs> Only a few and, left. Uh, yeah. And I gotta say, our major complaint for both of us this season has been sort of the way the show has kind of dragged its feet. This show could have been probably half its length. Um, just if we're viewing it as a, again, because we're viewing it as sort of a long movie, right? Because that's the way it's set up. That's the way it's sort of promised to us. And that's sort of what they're trying to do. But they keep, if it is one long movie, it's it, it could be half as long. Uh, it took us four episodes. At least two together. thirds. Yeah, I mean, it took us, we were, we were both frustrated that it took us four episodes to get out of that nebula um, when spending that much time and it didn't really add anything. And so then we we both sort of got excited. I know I certainly got excited last week when we finally were out of the nebula. We finally get, uh, found Jordy. You know, Troy showed up and the big reveal was that Data was coming back. And so last episode, episode six was really exciting. And then episode seven, we're back to waiting. We're back to uh, we're back to sort of drawing shit out. I feel like this whole episode could have been uh, done in ten minutes, uh, in the first ten minutes of the next episode. Uh, that's my major complaint about this week. It, it, there's obviously so. I mean, so now that we're back, it's like we we're not getting much more of data. We got very little of data in this episode, um, and basically they had to find they found Vatic themselves set a trap the trap got reversed on them and Vatic took over the ship that could have been take that could have been done in about 10 minutes with Vatic finds them and takes over the ship didn't have to have all everything else you know what i mean like just from a, from like a yeah. screenwriting perspective like chop it chop it chop it that's what you got to do as a screenwriter until you get the most concise you can get and that's not what they've done this season it's really frustrating uh but i am excited because at well, 2 a.m. next week, we're finding out what the hell the deal is with We Better. <laughs> if they drag it out some more. Well, I, I suspect they're, again, doing setup for stuff. Um, the problem with the first three episodes I had was that it was almost too much setup and mm -hmm. too much sort of not much happening kind of thing. This one is a little bit different in that I feel like... <sighs> We've gotten past the setup and we've gotten past sort of the reunion to a degree. We're now getting into like the meat of the show. The last two episodes have been the meat of what the story of this season is going to be. And I feel like because we're sort of approaching the climax of what this season is going to be, we need just a little bit more setup before the final sort of like before pieces start to fall in place, for instance, like revealing what's so important about Jack, what's so important about Picard, why the apparent misdiagnosis of the aromatic syndrome or whatever it's, however it's pronounced, um, why that is so important to things. <clears throat> this episode, I think, could have been half its length. I don't think 10 minutes, but I, I do think it could have been about half its length. Um, there are some things I loved. There's some things I didn't love. Again, with the data stuff, you say he's not in this episode much, but I feel like what they're doing with Data is going to play a role later in the season because there's this, since we found him, there's been this apparent duality between him and Laura. They discussed, like, previously we thought that, um, what's his name, their creator and B4 were, well, the son of the creator, I guess, or grandson, I don't, fucking long line of these goddamn people. This goddamn family. There's way too many of them. Um, we thought that there all four personalities were in there, but apparently these are just like subroutines within Data, um, and it's really just Data and Lore and this like conflict between their two personalities. And I have a feeling that because this is probably going to be a send off for a lot of these characters, and we're probably not going to come back to them again, especially because certain ones are a little older, and you know can't play the roles as well as they used to i have a feeling that they're this is going to be sort of a a, a crossing of the bridge or I, I don't know what how to term it but data and lore are basically going to come together to solve a problem later in the season that individually they can't kind of 
solve and it'll, it'll like it'll put together the put behind them the conflict that has been going on for 30 odd years now um <clears throat> and i have a feeling that's going to be sort of a pivotal plot point then again all of my predictions this season have been wrong um the prediction as to why you know they brought in uh, moriarty why lore shows up all of this stuff has been wrong um so I, i'll be glad to be proven wrong but i feel like there's something more to what they're doing with those two than just, you know, lore fucking things up for the sake of chaos, which yes is in character with him, but it's like, I don't know that that didn't land for me the way I think they thought it did kind of thing. So I'm really hoping maybe it's a hope more than expectation, but like, I'm hoping that there's more to this than just lore being a pain in the ass again. Like, um, and then, of course, like, there's little bits in this that, you know, I absolutely love that probably didn't need to be there. But I'm again, I'm hoping that it'll be a plot line coming up. Case in point, the whole Tuvok thing at the start of the episode where we see Tuvok and it's like this happy moment of like, oh, we see an old friend again, especially a friend of um, Seven, who is so important to her development uh, through the series, which was sort of a plot point in this. Um, and revealing that he's actually a uh, changeling that was kind of a bummer. Um, I did love that they brought in the Voyager theme, though. That was that made my heart swell a little bit. Not my favorite of the series, but uh, again, just going back home kind of thing feels good. Um, and I'm hoping that they, they, they imply at a certain point that because he knew about that game with the sticks that they play, that I can't remember the name of it, um, but the the one that you know Seven keeps beating him on, um, because he knew about that, it, it implies that like this changeling has some sort of connection to Tuvok. Probably has him captured somewhere, and I'm hoping that Seven will get the opportunity to free Tuvok from them. Maybe not. I don't know. Maybe it'll be an off screen sort of thing that's implied. But um, it would be nice to see more Voyager and um, DS9 people. Mm-hmm. Um, have sort of a role in this because of course while this is TNG's sort of last hurrah and this is the end of Picard's series it's very clear that all three series are sort of important to the plot of what's been going on especially this season so much of it hanging on DS9 you know Seven being such an integral character within at least the last two seasons roughly the first season a little bit um, so Voyager, you know, being kind of central, I would love to see Janeway again because of how important she is to the Federation because she is, you know, such a high ranking admiral and whatnot. Um, and of course, all kinds of other Voyager and DS9 characters that, you know, we haven't seen in 20, 30 years since both shows ended and would be nice to see them again. Again, Ro last two episodes or two episodes ago was, was the last episode of the episode before? It was the episode before. Four episodes ago. Yeah such a like left out of left field pull and it was so nice to see her and so nice to get closure on that story i feel like this season presents the opportunity to do that with a lot of characters and i don't expect everyone to have sort of a moment in the sun but you bring in tuvok i would hope that it's not just like a one-time cameo kind of thing um, the constant mention of Janeway, I hope that she maybe would have some sort of connection. I don't know. I haven't seen a casting that suggests that she's part of it. It may just be a name drop, but I, I think that there's opportunity there and it would be nice to see those things. Um, and again, the, like you like you alluded to, the mystery of what's been going on with Jack, we've gone back and forth about what it is, it, you know, being related to the Borg. Um, I'm, I'm leaning back into my theory that it has something more to do with the changelings because of just like how connected he seems to be to things, mm-hmm. um, especially with them. Like they really want him for some reason. I don't think it's just as a weapon, um, but I don't have anything to really back up why it would be, mm-hmm. um, why he would be a changeling. Um, I do wonder if <laughs> something that occurred to me partway through this episode, because he's got this like weird mind fuckery thing where he can like jump to other people's bodies and whatnot. And I'm like, Oh, he's not the son of Picard. He's the son of Xavier. <laughs> <laughs> not actually a theory it just it's something that occurred to me in the moment of like um yeah. he's got more to do with the other patrick stewart's role than this one but yeah. um I, I i would like to know more about that and of course the entire revelation of like vatic's backstory and the 
project proteus and section 31 and all that stuff mm-hmm. would be nice to get some closure on that kind of stuff um and maybe a little more backstory on that stuff because it, again it was sort of out of left field but um interesting that you know again starfleet sort of hubris of like trying to stop its own enemies and whatnot creates worse mm-hmm. enemies um yeah it occurred to me like you know how much gene roddenberry would hate this show which is okay because he would have hated deep space nine too um well i i think it's fascinating because it, it harkens back to con again where it's the mm-hmm. enemy that they created and it, like not yeah. starfleet itself but the humanity created and yeah now he's their biggest threat but like Roddenberry, I know that writers really struggled with Roddenberry when he was alive and no disrespect intended, they felt a lot freer after he died because he was so restrictive in his idyllic view of the future. It just yeah. didn't really lead to very, it led them to not be able to tell a lot of stories because no, 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 we're not, we're not going to have any conflict. We're going to be great. We're going to be, things are going to be fucking amazing. Um, and it's like, well, the nature of storytelling is conflict. So um like he would have hated the fact that the Federation went to war in Deep Space Nine. Like that, that's always been like there would be not gonna be any war in the future. Like he, you know, he would never have seen. And so when this episode comes along and we're starting to see the dark side, well, he never would have approved of Section 31 that the Federation has a dark side, that Starfleet has a dark side. And he certainly would not approve of, you know, this dark side of, of the Federation being like torturers of the uh, of the changelings and all that sort of stuff. So that's not a criticism. I'm just saying Gene Roddenberry wouldn't have liked it. That's OK with me. Uh, I also <laughs> I also think it's not realistic as much as I, I like his no, sort not. Of, that's the um, point. Yeah, he wasn't realistic and people couldn't stand it. N- not that w- I, I. I like his optimism about the future, but I don't think you can have an organization as broad as Starfleet without you know corruption it it just it's not realistic in my opinion as much as i love the idea of there being an idyllic future and you know something for us to kind of like go off into the sunset towards and be you know happy about what's to come again like you said nature of storytelling there has to be conflict and you know humanity isn't great at not being corrupt (laughs) and you know institution after institution we've seen fall because um, they kind of like eat each other from the inside out. Um, and like Starfleet has a long history of being kind of shady about shit. And I don't blame groups like the Changelings, especially after Vatic story, for being pissed off about what they've done. And, you know, granted, not everybody, like, I, I still hold to his ideal that, you know, not everybody in Starfleet is terrible and that the crews that we follow tend to be. Um, a reflection of his vision of the future and whatnot. But, mm-hmm. you know, again, I, I don't think it's realistic to have a government organization that broad and have that many hands in the pot. And, you know, they're not sure. the people who have ulterior motives. And um, especially when, like, we, we see it in American history all the time. And uh, I'm sure there's other, like, I'm sure there's Canadian history of it as well, but I, it doesn't seem to come out nearly as frequently. But we know the American government has been up to really shady shit over, you know, 200 plus years that it's been around. Um, like off the top of my head, MK Ultra being just this heinous um, sort of subplot within the CIA to mind control people and do all kinds of weird, you know, brain fuckery and whatnot. Mm-hmm it seems entirely reasonable that another organization that's supposed to be like the ideal version of that, um, although more socialist than democratic, but that's another argument to be had. Um, you know, there, there's going to, when, when you, when you have to deal with um, conflict and war, um, sometimes you got to do some really shady shit to, to, meet your means and like I- idealists don't have really a place in war and yeah. again that's that's why roddenberry wouldn't be a fan of it but like i don't know how you avoid that yeah um uh, let's talk about not to, not to defend things. that not defending yeah. that point of view i'm just saying that it happens it's not good but it does happen and it happening in starfleet to me makes sense yeah not defending I want to it. talk about the um <laughs> the uh uh, one of the key moments in this that I really did like was Jordy's um, sort of talk to Data, yeah. uh, which was very good acting, obviously on LeVar Burton's part, but it's something we've been waiting for because, well, at least waiting a week for, because that was uh, 
last week's episode where you know that was actually his his he had a little bit of good bit of acting in there when he was like um you know when he realized data was alive and he he brought back again this episode when he kind of poured his heart out to data and their their friendship began and i love the moment like i i can't lose data again i can't go through that again and picard was like yeah neither can i um but him pleading really to data great. him pleading to data that i cannot watch you die again like i've done mm-hmm. it twice and it's like it, it tore me apart and i'm yeah. just like here take my heart put it in the blender that you keep putting it into because god damn it people <laughs> Well, one thing that I really I didn't mention last week is that I actually really like appreciate the storytelling nature of last week is that this was a more hardened Jordy, who was like I you know he he he'd forgotten he almost kind of had forgotten who his friends were, or forgotten how familial he felt with them, and he was out to protect his own family, his own daughters, um, uh, more than anything, and so he was against doing anything to risk Sydney's life to help the crew. Uh, and she goes behind his back and does it. And as a consequence of her doing that, something he never expected to happen happened, which was that data was brought back. And that's when he sort of realizes the error of his ways. Like, holy shit, if I, if, you know, if I had had my way, data would not be back again here right now. Like this, like, thank you, Sydney, for reminding me of, of, you know, what I used to would have done and like how much these people really are important to me. And now I have my best friend back. Like this is, you know, I think that's great storytelling in, in last week's episode. We're here to review this week's episode. And I thought it was kind of a uh, too drawn out. Uh, but also the, the, the whole romantic aspect between Jack and Sydney is, is just getting weirder. Um, the, uh, the, is he flirting? No, darling. He's asking you out. There's a subtle difference. Uh, he's flat out asking you out. And she's like, well, at least be subtle about it. Touch my hand. How the fuck is that subtle? That's the opposite of subtle. She be subtle about it and reach over and touch my hand. That's not subtlety. And so it was so that, weird. That part, yeah, that poured it on creepy for me when he started to be able to control her, which of course plot wise became important because he could help her in that fight. But yeah, it's weird. Very but, uncomfortable yeah. that moment in the elevator. Again, like I said last week, it's not like I'm shipping them, you know, really at this point, as much as I'm sort of shipping the idea of, um, like I said, you know, John Lennon's son and um, and uh, and Mick Jagger's daughter used to date. And I just really lament the fact that they never reproduced together. Uh, it's just sort of that 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 idea of, oh, well, that's kind of cool. The offspring of the, those two getting together, you know, it's kind of sort of interesting. But um, but yeah, they, you, you're yeah, not the was... only one. I it hadn't even occurred to me until they kind of joked about it last episode Mm -hmm. when like Jordy just absolutely shut him down and stopped him and stopped casting over right in his tracks there. That was a great moment, but like it never occurred to me to ship them and I find out they like, they actually have a ship name and I'm like, there's a ship name. What is it? I don't remember what it is. It's, it's less something. Um, pressure. No, that's I'd have to look it up. It's it it, oh, it, it annoyed me, and it's like it's... no, because I hate shipping. It's one of, it's one of the things in fandom that drives me the most crazy. Like I don't care if you like two characters, but like the 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 level people go to about the characters that they love getting together, and when the show doesn't do it, they're like furious and like. Well, you and I have had this argument over Jeff and Britta on Community. You know, like oh, whatever. <laughs> so yes, I have some experience. Not what the show's about. If you say so. It's not what the show's about. <laughs> okay. <laughs> no, because... It, no, never mind. We're not going to... This is Star Trek, not Community. Star, we'll do that another Star time. Star Trek. We'll do that another time. Um, so overall, not the best episode, but I'm hoping the last three episodes are amazing. I feel like I've just done six weeks of just waiting and waiting. And I said in the beginning, like, if all we get is the last three episodes of the crew being together uh that's that three episodes is the length of a movie so if we just get the equivalent of one more next gen movie i'll be happy yeah. you got this is your last chance show <laughs> throw, throw them together next episode start making shit happen because i'm tired of waiting like <sighs> and it's kind of a bummer that we're doing this review thing because it would be at this point that i would wait for the last three episodes to watch them together mm-hmm. because you know it's going to be cliffhanger after cliffhanger until the finale and it's like, I, uh, sometimes I just like to be able to binge that yep. last section of a show together. 
And I, I, I don't mind the weekly. I actually prefer sort of the weekly um, release as opposed to the um, all at once release. Cause I don't feel like I have to push through an entire like season of stranger things in a night. So I don't get spoiled because of course, 6am there will be spoilers everywhere. Yeah. Um, this, I like that there's sort of a break in between and it feels like old television again, but mm-hmm. Except for the fact that we're getting up early in the morning and watching it. Oh, not me. No, I, I wait till later in the day because I can't do the I can't do the this late morning, night shit you were right on top of it. Uh it was like it was afternoon by the time I watched it. No, it was like eight, it was like nine AM that I sent you a message and you were like, Oh, you weren't that far behind me. Anyway, not important. I'm hoping for the best. This episode wasn't bad. It just was it was just seemed like more filler. That's my summation. Yeah. Well, I'm hoping that the filler is is less than filler and more just moving pieces into stage for the final sort of push. But I, I'm really starting to think that we're not going to get the Enterprise. It'll it'll it's in the trailer. It'll show up in a cameo. At but the is it only going to be in that one shot or not? Like I, I think I, that I might want... be the one shot. I think the one shot in the trailer might be the one shot in the show, but. It would be a huge miss if they tease the Enterprise and the crew of the Enterprise is not on the Enterprise. Yeah, like I would, I would love for there to be a final showdown of um, the ship that they're on now, um, which the name of it keeps escaping. I think it's Titan. the Titan. Yeah, yeah, the Titan and the Enterprise versus Vatic ship, and like one big final showdown. To me, that would be a great way to send it off. Yeah, especially with and this I group. am. I forgot to mention, I am quite actually still convinced it has something to do with the Borg. We know now this episode showed us that the person that Vatic is talking to is not really uh, Changeling. Yeah, there, there's about your people. There, there's one shot, apparently, that people caught that I miss completely. But if you look at the, the, the hologram for a minute, you can see a sort of like crescent shape on the forehead of it at one point. Which is oh, making gosh. people believe that the Cardassians are back involved again a because of course shape or a spoon shape because like crescent makes yeah you spoon think... spoon shape like right. a like an upside down crescent I should say okay. so it's like it's a, it's yeah the, the spoon shape of the Cardassians which may have just been you know the flux of the thing going but mm-hmm. um, you never know with a show like this they might be hinting at something and of course Cardassians of course being very deeply involved with um, the, the Dominion during the Dominion War yeah. and all that. So entirely possible. I would rather it be the Borg because of how connected, but this this late in the game, introducing Mm -hmm. the Borg would be such a weird left field kind of thing. That's, you know, I I, I would like it too, because I love the Borg and, you know, we'll get to our enjoyment of the Borg later. But um, another thing that I wanted to bring up, not about this episode, but the last episode was that we were talking about the ships and something mm-hmm. I lamented that we later realized I was actually incorrect about was the fact that the NX-01 was not there. And it was, they just didn't focus on it. And I didn't recognize it because it was the um, altered version that was supposed to show up in season five that was designed by... My friend Doug Drexler. Yes. Which, <laughs> again, by the way, tell him I love the redesign on that ship. It's a stunning, gorgeous looking redesign because it, it brings it more into the... like classic um enter like the 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 ncc 1701 enterprise look the original you know series kind of look as opposed to the nx01 which i still love the look of the nx01 but just it bringing it that one step further just made it like oh i i wish that they'd focused on that just a little bit more because again i would love more enterprise in this show um just i i I, I feel like I'm the only one holding a flame for that show anymore, but um, <laughs> it's still it's still probably my favorite Trek series. Flame me as much as you want in the comments. It it just meant a lot <laughs> to me. So, um, all right, all right. Anything else? Uh, I'm sure I'll think of it like ten minutes after we're done. But okay, <laughs> I'll throw an addendum on the next episode if something does occur to me. But yeah, overall right. lopsided episode. But you know important setup for things to come and leave us on a cliffhanger that ryan was pissed about yes i was like no (laughs) it's gonna be the longest week of my life but anyway that'll do us for today folks tell us what you thought of star trek picard 3.6 and leave your comments in the section below and as always 
like, share, subscribe, everything, all the whole kit and caboodle. Until next time, I'm Ryan Murphy. And I'm James Sheridan. And thank you for keeping it real. With real time. Good night. Engage. Thank <laughs> you.